Okay. I think we're all here. Um, so what are we doing today? Well, first of all, we have the second problem set to work on from chapter five, that is. And then when that's done, <clears throat> I do have a couple of videos that I still want you to see from this chapter that uh, we missed somehow last time. And, uh, and just as, by the way, just as I thought, uh, the recordings from last time are split up into two pieces. Because remember, we were having technical issues. Uh, the whole thing froze up and I had to reboot my computer. So if you want to watch the video from last time, just be aware that there's two pieces to it. There's a part one and a part two before the disaster and after the disaster, in other words. But I mean, at least I recorded everything. So that much we don't have to worry about. So anyway, so um, we'll do this today. This is number two. Now we'll save number three for next time. Um, in fact, since we're not completely done with chapter, I'll tell you what, maybe we better save that even for the following Thursday, just because I just realized that the number three problem set has a lot of questions about um, sequences, which we haven't completely finished yet. So let's do this. The third problem set from chapter five, let's not do it next Monday, but let's save it for next Thursday. Uh, just to have time to, uh, you know, think about what we're doing today, because I'm hoping we can finish chapter five today, but it's not guaranteed. So, um, so for today, we'll do this. We'll try to finish part uh, chapter five C where we have our sequences. And if not, we'll, we'll have to do the rest of that next week. And then of course, in the middle, I'd like you to see a couple of fun videos, which involve infinity and prime numbers. All right. So first things first, let's look at this. And some of these are quite straightforward. Some of these are a little messier, but they all involve radicals somehow. So first of all, these are just straight yes or no questions. Now, is the square root of 49 rational or irrational? And the answer is yes, because the square root of 49 is seven. And that's a seven is obviously an integer, which means that it's rational. And of course, um, just remind, a quick reminder, 49 is a perfect square in the rule, and I'll just sneak this in here, um, the square root of any perfect square is rational, the square root of any other number is irrational, okay? So in other words, because 49 is a perfect square, that guarantees that its square root is irrational. I'm sorry, rational because it's seven. For this next one, 37, it's the other way around. Okay, 37 is clearly not a perfect square. So therefore, oh, actually, you know, I just realized I shouldn't have said yes. Um, this is rational. The square root of 49 is rational. That's right. The answer is not yes or no. It's rational or irrational. The square root of 49 is rational because the square root of 49 is seven. And I'll just add one more detail here, which is an integer. And the parentheses I'll add all integers are rational. Okay, so there's no doubt about what we're saying here. All right, so square root of 49 is seven. Seven is an integer that guarantees that it is rational. But in general, the square root of any perfect square is rational because it is an integer. All right, let me add that little detail here. And then the square root of any other number is irrational. All right, now we've got it straight. Now, 37, well, that's a different story altogether. Square root of 37 is irrational because 37 is not a perfect square. In other words, the square root of 37 is not an integer. In fact, I'm just going to go to my calculator right now and see what it is. Um, 37, it's going to be slightly over six. 6.082 three, no, sorry, two, seven, six, five, two, five, three. And you can see that it is neither a terminating nor repeating. Therefore, this is an irrational number. Beautiful. All right. So that hopefully makes sense to everyone. Now, this one's a little tricky. I'll tell you why. Because at first glance, it appears that it is a repeating decimal. 
But if you look at it more carefully, you'll see that we start with 0.23 and then it becomes 0.233 and then 2333. So that does not constitute a pattern or it is not, in other words, it is not a repeating decimal. In order for it to be repeating, it would have to be something like 0 0.23, 23, 23, 23, 23, always the same. Here, the pattern changes as we go along. Every time we get a new three in here, okay, so this means that this is not re, uh, repeating and it is not terminal, so it is irrational. Terminal means it stops, okay? Um, these three dots, the ellipsis means that it goes on forever. So it's not repeating, it is not terminal, therefore it is irrational. Now five over six clearly is rational. It, you can see it, it is a ratio. Since five six is a ratio of two integers, it is rational. In fact, that's what it means to be rational, a ratio of two integers. The word rational includes the word ratio. And there's a reason for that because it's a ratio, all right? So it's a very well-chosen name. Now pi, although we don't, we're not really in a position to prove it or disprove it, um, just remember pi is irrational. So mathematicians have been studying this forever and um, I don't know, they just, they keep finding more, like in the, they keep trying to figure out how many decimals it actually has. And it just, you know, they keep using computers to find more and more complex results, but still to this day, they haven't found a ratio that it's equal to. So pi is irrational. I guess they never will. The thing that drives them crazy though, is that they can't find a proof. A proof means that you can prove that for every possible case, this is either true or false. And so there doesn't seem to exist a proof. Instead, all they can do is show that there is no such number, or at least that mention that they can't find a number, um, which is not really a proof. Like, I mean, the idea is that it's supposed to be a ratio. And the fact that you can't find one doesn't mean it is, doesn't exist. It just, it might mean we just haven't found it. So this is a point of contention among mathematicians, but um, pi is considered to be irrational. On the other hand, zero is rational because we can rewrite it as the ratio of any uh, many different integers. For example, zero over one, zero over two, zero over three, etc. which these are all ratios of integers. Okay, so in other words, this is one of those cases where there's many different ways of expressing it as a ratio of two integers. And therefore, and remember zero itself is an integer. So therefore um, it is rational. Okay, now we're getting to the fun territory, simplify. Now, when we say simplify, we want something, um, basically your goal is to avoid, let's, let's just, I just want to briefly summarize this. When simplifying radicals, um, the goal is to avoid having radicals in the denominator of an expression and to keep the radicals as small as possible. Now, what does that mean? <clears throat> so in other words, right here, radical 24 is a perfectly good number, but we can write it in a simpler way by doing the following. The first thing we want to do is look for factors, okay? What factors does 24 have? Well, it has a lot of them, but the ones we're interested in are the ones where at least one of them is a perfect square. If it exists, if not, well, there's nothing we can do about it. But if you look at this carefully, you'll see that this is four times six, which means I can rewrite it as radical four, radical six, or two radical six. So in other words, to a mathematician, two radical six is preferred to radical 24 because the value under the square root sign or the radical is smaller. It's six instead of 24. Okay, so the goal is to streamline this so that the radical, whatever's left is as small as possible. And part of the reason for that is because this way it might be easier to perform algebraic operations on these radicals. Okay, 
Um, it's just, it's a convention, but also it has benefits by doing it this way. It's just like uh, with fractions, you know, if you get an answer to a math question like eight, six, you've always throughout your whole life been encouraged to reduce that to four thirds. Okay, it's, it's a convention, but it has good benefits because if I have another fraction in terms of threes, it's easier to see how to combine them. All right, so how about, and by the way, also I just wanna remind you too, in some cases it's not possible to simplify a radical. All right, in other words, it says simplify the radical. I should have said in parentheses, if possible, all right? Like for example, uh, a prime number, the square root of 13, for example, there's nothing we can do to simplify it. So just be aware that it's not always possible to do this. Now here's one. We can break this up into the product of two numbers, one of which is a perfect square. Ah, there you go. And we're done. Okay, and you can see three is clearly a much smaller number than 27. And so that means we've accomplished something very useful here. Very nice. How about 80? Now, by the way, sometimes there's more than one way of doing this. It's so, usually in math, it's very rare that there's only one way to do something. And you'll discover that as you go along. Like you may have, uh, tried this and you may have started with um, a different pair of factors. Um, it doesn't really matter. Eventually you'll get to the same place. So here we can try 16 and five. Nice, okay, we're done. <laughs> so yes, now the next one, it may not be crazy obvious, but there is a perfect square hiding in here because this is simply 25 times seven. Ah, uh, who knew? It might've taken you a, a while to notice that one. That one was a little tricky, but um, so yes, it, that's how we can simplify this one very nicely and easily. All right, now 30, surprisingly enough, let's take a look at 30. What are the factors of 30? One and 30, two and 15, three and 10, five and six, that's it. Are any of these perfect squares? No. So that means that surprisingly, even though 30 is not a prime number, um, the square root of 30 cannot be simplified any further. That's it. I mean, you could write it as radical five times radical six, but that doesn't really get you anywhere. If you can't um, simplify it like you can up here, then you just leave it. There's no point. There's no benefit, for example, to writing it as radical two times radical 15. Um, it doesn't, if anything, that's making things worse. Now look at 42. I think you'll be surprised to discover that the same thing is going to happen here. You look at a number like that and say, oh, surely it has to have at least one factor, which is a perfect square. Well, let's check it out. Um, four doesn't go five, six. Wow. Oh, this is so disappointing. Oh no, I didn't mean to bum you out so early in the morning, but no, the square root of 42 cannot be simplified any further. Okay, well, you know, that's just the way it goes then, you know, I can't, you know, like the same thing with fractions. There's a certain point where it can't be simplified any further. Now let's take a look at this one. Uh, I know what to do.
That's the one. So this one ends up being 20 radical five. So here you've got to watch it because there's a constant already in front of that radical 20, which we have to take into account. So you're simplifying radical 20 right here, but when you're done, you don't, don't forget to multiply it by 10. Okay. All right, so by the time we're done with this, you'll be experts in simplifying radicals, right? In fact, if I could, if I could, I'd give you a little certificate that says master of simplifying radicals, but I guess we won't do that. Um, it might be fun, it, look, it would look fun on your wall, wouldn't it? Master of simplifying radicals. I think that would impress people, don't you? Of course it would. All right, now, this one, you can break up the eight into four times two. And we just end up with eight radical two, very nice. So again, remember always the goal is within the radical, see if you can find two factors where at least one of them is a square, a perfect square. If they're both perfect squares, then we're really happy because we'll end up with an integer. But often that's not the case. Okay. Ah, uh, now here's an interesting one. Three radical 700. Well, there's a lot of possibilities there, but I think we should go right for the obvious one. Oh yeah, 100 is hiding in there. That's the ultimate perfect square. It couldn't be more obvious. So this winds up being 30 radical seven. Now, if you ever doubt that you've done this correctly, you could literally just go to your calculator and type in three times radical 700 and then do the same thing with 30 radical seven and see if they're the same number and you will get the same number. Like for example, I'm gonna do that right now. 30 times radical seven is approximately equal to 79.37. If you try that again with three radical 700, you'll get the same thing. All right, so that's one way you can double check your results in these cases. All right, here we go. Um, two radical 162. Well, this one has a surprise waiting for you. Look what we can do. Oh, there you go. And if you're not sure, just go through the list of perfect squares. All right, remember it's one, four, nine, 16, 25. Um, and just try them, all right? You may not, if you don't notice it right away, just make up a list and keep looking. You might find one, you might not. Okay. Not oh, very. Uh, now, ooh, now look at these. Now we've got a challenge in front of us. Here's what we should do. Most of the time, unless one of the two radicals is already a perfect square, your best bet is to combine them first. And then look at it and say, wait a minute. Oh, I see what I could do. How do you like that? So in other words, here, we might not have ever found it if we didn't consolidate them into a single term. But once we did, it became clear that we can just write this out as four times five, and we end up with two radical five. Now, I think you'll agree that two radical five is much simpler than the product of two individual radicals. Now, how about this one? 15, radical 15, radical six. Let's write that out as radical 90. Oh, very good, because look what we can do now. Uh, 
All right, now 18 times 15, what is that equal to? Okay, that's 270. Now, the challenge is finding a perfect square. Well, we don't have to look too far because this is divisible by nine. And interestingly enough, we just got through proving earlier that radical 30 cannot be simplified any further. Therefore, we're done. It's just simply three radical 30. Now here is a case where we don't have to really do anything because this is already a perfect square. So let's do this. And by the way, the convention here is to always put the uh, radical last. In other words, in a case like this, we would rewrite it as five radical five. Not that there's any thing wrong with radical five times five, but this is just a convention. And you normally see it written this way. Um, the radicals are usually last in the expression. So let's keep it like this. Well, you can see where this came from. That radical 25 is already five. So there's nothing, there's no reason to combine them. Um, our work is already done here. All right, um, let's see what's next. Now we're getting even more challenging. So what do we have to do in these cases? You might recall that because both of these radicals has what we call a coefficient, what we need to do is first multiply them out. So I'm gonna multiply the two coefficients to get six, and then I have radical 48, because that's six times eight. And then it turns out that one of the factors of 48 is 16. So that's a break, the break we were looking for. And finally, we end up with 24 radical three. Okay. All right, let's see what's next. So we're gonna have 12 times radical 75, because that's of course 15 times five. And of course, six times two is 12. So we're gonna end, end up with, ah, look what I can do with 75. <clears throat> Oops, no, that's not right. It's 12 times five radical. And so ultimately our final answer is 60 radical three. Okay. Now, what about these ratios? In these cases, just like when we started multiplying up here, what we always did was multiply the numbers first. Here, we're going to divide first, just to see what, the, what ends up happening. Unless either of the two terms is already a perfect square, let's just divide. And once again, here's our old friend radical 30. This cannot be simplified any further, so we are done. Keeps popping up all over the place, doesn't it? That happens sometimes with certain numbers. Now, what about this one? Now, seven is a prime number, so clearly it can't be simplified any further. So that one's done.
Oops, sorry. Um, now, what about this one? Let's rewrite it like this. This time though, I can rewrite it as a perfect square times two. And so I ultimately wind up with two radical two. Um, all right, oh, hold on. Let me let you give it a minute to keep up. All right. Uh, let's see, man, there are, there's so many. Oh yes, one more division. And then we can get to addition and subtraction. <clears throat> this one's pretty straightforward. Um, you can see that the ratio gives us radical five. That's a, that's a prime number. So we'll just stop right there. Now here, now remember the rule with addition, you cannot add two radicals unless they're the same, okay? In other words, two radical seven plus 10 radical seven, not a problem. We can add those together and we'll get two plus 10 times radical seven, which is just 12 radical seven. So it's simple because these are the same radicals. If they're not the same, unless we can rearrange them or change them into a different form somehow, then we simply can't add them together. Because they're not the same thing. Like here, this is the equivalent of having two apples plus 10 apples. We end up with 12 apples. But if the radicals are different, that would be like trying to add two oranges to 10 apples and you can't do that. But sometimes you can rearrange them a little bit and, and get around that problem, but often you can't. So here's another good example of this. They're both radical 11, not a problem. You're probably saying, oh, please give us a hard one. And it's just 61 radical 11, just what you would expect. Okay, great. Now subtraction works too, but again, we have to make sure that they are the same radical. That's true here. We have eight minus 15 times radical three, minus seven radical three, and we're done. That's it, that's all there is to it. So these are nice. Oh, look at these. Ooh. Now these are challenging because we'll probably have to simplify each individual radical before we even attempt to combine them. Like I was saying before, um, now let's see what we can do with these. It looks like we can turn these into the products of at least one perfect square. So let's see, 320 would be, oh, wait a minute. Let me just try something. Well, you might be surprised to discover this is 64 times five and this is 16 times five. Wow, did we ever get lucky here? Oh, what did I do? My intent, no, hold on. No, now we split it up. And this is eight radical five. This is four radical five. And guess what? Now I can combine these into four radical five. Oh no, look how messy this looks. It looks like, no, we can't do anything with them, but it turns out that we can because we were able to simplify them. And so this is a classic example of when simplification is so helpful because we were able to reduce a very messy expression into a much simpler one. 
Now, it's not always possible to do this, but when it is, we'd like to make sure that we take advantage of it. Now, if you didn't notice that 64 is a factor of both of these, let's say you use 16 instead, which you could have done, you would have eventually discovered that you had another factor that could also be decomposed. So in other words, eventually you would have worked your way to the right answer anyway. Now, how about these two? Hmm, can these, can we do anything with these? Let's find out. Well, the first one is 25 times five. The second, oh, again, we got lucky. Look at this. All right, see how nice and clean that is? Yep, all of a sudden, oh, wait a minute, what did I do? Sorry, I did everything right except this, it's seven. Sorry about that, it's seven. Yes, so in other words, 25 times five, four times five. So we end up, the first radical is actually five radical five. The second one is two radical five. And when we add these together, we end up with seven radical five. Very nice. Okay, now this one looks pretty promising. I'll tell you why, because I think um, 80 is certainly, uh, has five as one of its factors. Okay, oops, oops, oops. Okay, so the first term I haven't touched, of course, the second term, 80 is 16 times five, so I can split that up into three radical 16, radical five, or three times four radical five. And so my final result is, um, oops, hold on one second. Uh, the final result is negative six radical five. Okay, so again, that one was a little challenging. It, you, you know, but when you see that the 80 is divisible by five, that gives you, could give you ideas. You might say, well, you know, there might be a way I can simplify the second term and combine it with the first term. As long as I can find a radical five in there, I'll be able to do that. Okay, now what about this one? Now this one, ooh, you know, this one might, looks a little like maybe we, our luck has run out. Let's see if there's anything we can do here. The first one can be, oh, maybe, no, maybe we did get lucky again. Because look what happened. 90 is nine times 10, 40 is four times 10. Yeah, I think we're good. All right, so we've got 13 times three radical 10, five times two radical 10, 39 radical 10, 10 radical 10, 49 radical 10 is our final answer. All right, um, now, oh, here we go, rationalizing. This is a different uh, process, but it can make things easier for us. Sometimes, remember the rule of thumb is to never have radicals in the denominator. And if that's all you accomplish, that's still important, but sometimes that can also make it easier to simplify. And of course, simplification is always something we wanna do whenever possible, okay? 
Um, so anyway, let's get to this. Now, how do we do this? Well, first of all, whatever the, rash, uh, the denominator is, this is our basic strategy. We know that it's possible to multiply any number by one without affecting its value. But we can choose any form of one we like. It could be three thirds, four fourths, five fifths, or it could be in this case, radical five fifths, uh, radical five over five rather. Why did I pick radical five? I want the denominator to be um, not um, a radical. In other words, I want it to be an integer if possible. And in fact, I've accomplished exactly that because now I end up with radical five over five and now I can't go any further. That's it, we're done. It may not look any simpler, but to a mathematician, this is much better than one over radical five. I don't know the exact reason why mathematicians avoid radicals in the denominator, but those are the rules, you know, that's the convention. So we'll follow that along. You know, there's a lot of things we do in math because of conventions. Um, it's just what we're used to. There's just a certain order that we like to see things being done in. It's kind of like, um, imagine you go to the supermarket and they tell you, you buy merchandise that's worth $10.42. Would the person behind the cash register ever tell you that your, your bill is 42 cents and $10? No. It's a perfectly valid answer though, 42 cents and $10. It, it certainly is correct, but normally we say $10 and 42 cents. Why? Well, we just do, okay? Mathematically, 42 cents and $10 is $10 and 42 cents, but that's our convention, all right? So anyway, let's do this one. And again, whatever is in the denominator, that's what's going to be multiplied in this ratio. Okay, so there's, you don't really have to uh, make any decisions here. Whatever it says here, that's what's going in our ratio. So we have three radical eight over eight. Now, you might think we're done, but guess what? Look what we can do. Okay, so you see that <laughs> it's not as simple as it could be because we can now write this as and now we just simplify the six eighths again by convention, we'll reduce that to three radical two over four. So that's our final answer. Not that this number is not right. I mean, it is, it is correct. But our goal is to keep things as simple as possible. And that means reducing the radical as much as we can. So therefore the preferred answer would be three radical two over four. Okay. But I mean, you can see that once you get the hang of these problems, the logic, there's nothing to memorize, not really. Um, and that's kind of a good thing because you know you can forget things that you've memorized, but once you understand the logic behind something, you, you really can't ever forget it. You, you Understanding is something you can't lose, let's put it that way. Memorizing things, eh, you know, you, at one point you memorized all the state capitals, but who remembers the capital of Nebraska? Well, some of you might, but it might also be gone. But because you are taught how to multiply, you'll never forget. So here are the ideas to understand the logic. Always the logic, all right. So let's try this. Now, you know already what we're going to do. Automatically just multiply by radical six over radical six. Now, radical six can't be simplified any further, but three over six can, because that's just one half. Very nice. Okay. How about this one? 
And again, automatically just multiply this by radical 20 over radical 20. Now here, there's a couple of things we can do. The 20 itself is four times five. So let's work on that first. Oh, this is interesting. Look what we ended up with. Now, I like that one <laughs> because it's not only simpler, it's just a single term. It's not even a ratio anymore. So mathematicians would be very delighted to see this. And we are too, aren't we? Think of us, we can think of ourselves as maybe amateur mathematicians. How about that? Um, we love this stuff, but we don't do it for a living. That makes us amateurs. <laughs> yes, I like that idea. Of course, some of you, you never know where this might lead to. You know, the school does have a math major. Um, so if you suddenly say to yourself, oh my God, Where's this been all of my life? Well, you might want to go over and take a little visit to the math department and see what they've got. Um, all right, well, anyway, what about this one? All right, now this one's a little more challenging. Um, what you want to do is rewrite it like this. And now we're going to do the same process that we normally do. This one's going to be tricky to simplify. In the numerator, what you want to do, well, here we have a 28. If you multiply three by 28, you're going to get 84. Now that one sounds like something that should be, uh, have a, a factor, which is a perfect square. Now, Obviously, four works. I wonder if 16 works. Let's take 84 and divide by 16. No, not 16. So <laughs> let's not get greedy. Let's go with four. Now, it looks to me like that's as simple as it's going to get. Oh, one more thing, of course, what am I saying? No, we can do one more thing. Two over 28 is one over 14. Now we're done. Okay, now we're really and truly done. There's nothing else we can do. All right. Now, one ninth, um, interestingly enough with one ninth, you already have two perfect squares. So there's nothing really to do except rewrite it as one third. All right, and finally, uh, one more, that's it, we're done. Um, now this is the ratio of two prime numbers. Let's see what we can do with this. Now, there's nothing else we can do. That's it. We're done. Okay, that's it. We're done. So now um, I promised you a couple of cool videos. So let's do that. And when we're done with that, we can go back into 5C and pick it up where we left off with the... Um, arithmetic and geometric sequences. Okay, so first let me get that together. The links are here on Moodle. Hmm. Okay, well I see something is not right. 
Hmm. This is very bizarre. Uh, is anyone out there able to hear or see me? Yeah, we can. Oh, because there's something strange about the screen. If you could see everybody's names have disappeared. All right, well, as long as you can see what I'm doing, um, the only problem is the normal um, toolbar is not really working properly. Well, we can see you, but the screen is still the, the problems. All right, I'll tell you what, I'm, I don't know what's going on here. Um, I guess I'm going to have to reboot my computer again and we'll start up properly in a couple of minutes. Um, this, this is the first time I've ever seen this happen. I don't know if there's a problem with Zoom. I don't think there's anything wrong with my computer, which I never know. So I'll tell you what, I'm gonna reboot the computer and then I'll turn it back on again and we'll see if uh, we can go on from there. I'm pretty sure it's being recorded properly, but um, like the last time, we'll have to have two separate recordings. All right, so hold on, I'm gonna reboot, which is very annoying, but it shouldn't take but a couple of minutes. Wow, this is so annoying. Um, all right, so yeah, let me let me just quickly take care of that. 